All right, so this is going to be uh, hopefully a very quick um, uh, coverage uh, of the CAPM at uh, undergraduate level. So just assuming you know we've covered Markowitz uh, um, and, and really nothing else. Uh, so um, uh, first, um, the assumptions that are going to go into, into, into the CAPM. Uh, one, um, uh, people are price uh, fundamentally people are price takers. So everyone has an endowment of wealth, which is. Um, you know, uh, fundamentally, you know, a fairly equivalent, meaning no one has uh, so much wealth that they can push the market. Uh, simple um, uh, assumptions in, 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 you know, as you'd see uh, in anything like the Black-Scholes model. Um, uh, perfect market, so no transaction costs, no um, uh, taxes and so forth. So uh, simple assumptions like that. Um, Investments are limited to the to the publicly uh, traded universe of, of, of assets. And one thing is throughout this, I'm going to say um, asset or stock. Just use those interchangeably. Of course, this could be risky bond and so forth. But uh, um, uh, but publicly traded assets. Uh, the big assumption here is investors are mean variance optimizers. So keep in mind uh, we're making every assumption of. Um, that went into the to because the the cap M is assuming Markowitz and every assumption that went into Markowitz is now being pulled up into the cap M. So in other words, just to remind you, some uh, assumptions that we made at Markowitz uh, were that uh, people care about the mean and the variance. They don't uh, mean and covariance. So in other words, uh, things like skewness or excess kurtosis are not. Um, we assume that, 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 that the assets don't have these. So therefore, they uh, they don't go into our. Um, Construction of the uh, construction of the portfolio. So, in other words, you can think of if if uh, people have a preference for skewness and if stocks are skewed and have uh, uh, excess ketosis, then the results here um, wouldn't follow. Uh, so, uh, every assumption of the cap M gets pulled up into. I mean, every assumption of market gets gets pulled up into the cap M. Uh, and the other the uh, other big assumption is a homogeneous expectation. So everyone believes. Uh, uh, the same thing about uh, how assets will behave. So everyone believes the same expected returns and covariances between all assets. Uh, we also, assuming that all investors have the same time horizon. So if all investors have the same time horizon, and if they all have the same uh, opinion uh, about covariances and, and expected returns on securities, then remember, uh, um, they all are going to hold the same portfolio. Remember, the, the, the big thing about Markowitz, that, that was why it's, you know, uh, such a big deal is that we're creating, we're able to create optimal risky portfolios that are, um, regard, you know, regardless, uh, their, the investor preferences don't flow into that calculation. In other words, you give me a set of stocks, you give me the expected returns and the covariances, I turn a crank and I get out my, um, my weights, and it's, it's a purely mechanical process. I get out my optimal portfolio weights. So keep in mind that gives us the first um, uh, implication of the cap M or, or the first observation that goes into it is that um, if everyone has the same uh, time period, uh, everyone has the same beliefs about uh, um, how stocks will behave, then everyone will hold the same portfolio. So as a consequence, uh, everyone holds the same portfolio. If everyone holds the same portfolio, then that portfolio must be the market portfolio. So in other words, First implication, um, you know, from Markowitz and the assumptions that we just talked about are all investors hold. I'll just put M for the market portfolio. All investors hold the market portfolio. Uh, now, keep in mind, this also means this is a, the first thing that we could test about the cap M. In other words, um, if all investors hold a market portfolio and this portfolio is mean variance efficient, uh, so we can test if the market portfolio is mean variance efficient. If we can show that it's not, then uh, the cap M then doesn't hold. Uh, but uh, so we're, we're making an assumption all investors hold the market portfolio. To see that this you know, follows, uh, imagine if um, everyone holds the same portfolio, but no one holds a particular stock. Well, then that stock will have no market value if it's not in the portfolio. Uh, so um, it's a fairly solid assumption, uh, uh, implication of the assumptions that we made. One other thing before I, I get into a little bit more, keep in mind that we have made a lot of assumptions are fairly, you know, we've, we've added homogeneous expectations uh, and, and pulled that into Markowitz. And these are, these are big assumptions. This is the problem ultimately with the cap M and why uh, alternatives like the APT are, are somewhat um, popular or, or useful. It's that uh, um, the cap M gets to a really useful result but makes a lot of assumptions to get there. So if we could get to that same result using few, far fewer assumptions like in the APT, then that's something you know, worth looking into. Uh, good. So all investors hold the market portfolio. So if all investors hold the market portfolio, 
we can directly say that the, the measure of any, the risk on any asset is the contribution to overall portfolio risk. So in other words, remember, the overall risk of our portfolio um, is going to be the sum over i equals 1 to n, sum j equals 1 to n, over all the assets in our portfolio, weight in i, weight in j, covariance between returns on i and returns on j. So this is how we measure, you know, this, this is a, calcula a way to calculate portfolio variance. Um, it's just the, 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 all the covariance, of course, n of those are going to be variances. Uh, uh, so what we can say is if all investors hold the market portfolio, then the risk on any asset should be the contribution to the risk in the market portfolio. So, um, uh, so let's take a, just a, a generic asset A and calculate the, the, the contribution of asset A's risk to uh, uh, the market risk. Um, so we can do that by saying, okay, well, I'm not, um, uh, I'm, well, should I, should I just use asset I? I'll just use asset I because I, I have it here. Um, so I'll, I'll calculate contribution of asset I's risk uh, to um, uh, the market risk. So uh, what I can do is I'm now, I'm not summing over all, I'm still summing over J's 1 to N, but I'm not summing over I's 1 to N. So I can say uh, this is the weight in I, uh, sorry, uh, the sum J equals 1 to N, uh, weight in I, weight in J, covariance return on I and return on J. Again, I'm only summing over all J, these, these, what, that weight in I is the same. Uh, good. So now using a, a particular result, so uh, what we can do is because just for generic x, y, and z random variables, the covariance of x plus y and z is equal to the covariance of x and z plus the covariance of y and z, right? Because of this, you can see that this is how we have the term. So we can, we can you know, so this is how our equation is right now. Uh, we can take all of these um, uh, x and y's out of these covariance terms. So in other words, we can rewrite this as equal to the weight in i, uh, yeah, uh, weight in i, covariance, the return on i, and uh, the sum j equals 1 to n, weight in j, return on j. Good. Yes. So now we use this, you know, we can use the assumption that all investors hold the market portfolio. Um, this is, this is, the, these, uh, this is every, you know, this is every asset that, that people hold. This is the, you know, these are every asset in the market portfolio, and they're held in weights appropriate to uh, their weight in the market portfolio. So this term here is just the return on the market. So we can say that this is equal to the weight in asset I uh, times the covariance of the return on I and the return on the market. So in other words, asset I's uh, contribution to uh, the, the variance of the market is, is that term right there. Uh, good. Now, what we, you know, what also of interest, of course, is the contribution, so if that's I's contribution to overall portfolio, um, risk, variance, then uh, we can also write the, the overall portfolio, uh, contribution of asset I to the overall, um, uh, uh, the overall uh, risk premium, the return on the market. So weight in I times the expected return on asset I minus the risk free rate. This is asset I's contribution to return. This is asset I's contribution uh, to risk. Uh, of course, uh, scaling this, so saying uh, we can calculate the return per unit risk. We can write this as weight in I times a covariance, return on I, return on the market. So this gives us a measure of the um, excess return per unit risk uh, uh, of, of asset I. In, uh, uh, now, of course, you know, we, can, we, can, we, can, we can cancel that out. Uh, now the next sort of observation, and this is... Um, uh, or, or next thing to think about is how the, the uh, return per unit risk on asset I relates to the return per unit risk for some other asset in the economy. So the question is, how does this relate to the expected return on asset J minus the risk free divided by the covariance of the return on J with the return on the market? Can it be this? 
And this is where the equilibrium argument of the cap M comes in. So we sit there and say, okay, well, um, if this were the case, uh, then you know, every, everyone in the economy would, every, every investor would shift their uh, uh, portfolio over to asset I and away from asset J. Everyone buys asset I, the expected return on asset I goes down, the numerator gets smaller, uh, so this gets smaller, and then this gets larger as the expected return on J increases. So in other words, in equilibrium, uh, in equilibrium meaning people aren't shifting their portfolios, in equilibrium, uh, these should be equal. So we can say, all right, well, these, this is equal. Now this is, this is again, another problem with, with, with the cap M uh, in terms of, well, I, I guess, frankly, it's you know, believability, um, is this requires you know, everyone in the economy to, to shift their portfolios. Uh, which is, you know, uh, a, a sort of a big assumption. This is also why the APT is, is nice, because the APT relies on arbitrage. It only it relies on one investor to see mispricing and to take advantage of that. So uh, this requires uh, everyone in the economy to change, you know, to shift their portfolios to change their behavior. So, um, so this is equilibrium argument. One other thing I, I, you know, I, I wanted to mention in the beginning, and I'm just remembering now, so I'll say it. Keep in mind, another implication or another assumption of the cap end is we don't have any other forms of income. Um, uh, in other words, we don't have labor income and so forth. The, the CAPM has expanded um, to cover those sorts of cases. So I don't think that that's a, you know, we can include labor income and so forth in the CAPM. Uh, but that's another sort of, you know, thing to keep in mind. Uh, we're only considering, you know, wealth from, from our portfolio. So if this is true, then I can immediately say, well, this should be true for the market because the market is just another asset of the economy. And remember the covariance between the return on the market and the return on the market. Uh, this is just the variance of the market. So directly from this, we can get, this implies the expected return on stock I is equal to the risk-free rate plus the covariance returns on I with the returns on the market divided by the variance of the market. Expected return on the market minus risk-free. And we get our cap equation. Uh, our capital asset pricing model. Keep in mind, this is a capital asset pricing model. Uh, not, the, you know, don't say the capital asset pricing model. It's the most famous capital asset pricing model. Um, and it's just one way to price the capital assets. But uh, good. So what we can uh, immediately get from this is the expected return on any asset in the economy is a function of a couple things. One, pure time value of money. This is this is again the risk-free rate. Uh, it is a function of how that asset co-varies um, with, with uh, the market portfolio. So in other words, um, it's a function of, you know, the extent to which, you know, my, um, uh, uh, my asset, the extent to which cash flows from this asset are going to uh, co-vary um, with the market. So keep in mind, when you think about like a company's beta, uh, the, the more cyclical it is, the more it's going to co-vary with just generally the market, the higher, um, the higher this is going to be, the higher expected return it's going to be. Also, if you leverage up, um, you are, you know, if you're already cyclical and you leverage up, that just magnifies this covariance. So levering up financial leverage or operating leverage is going to increase that covariance. It's going to increase the expected return on the stock. Um, good. And uh, last term here is um, this is the reward for bearing uh, unit of market risk. So keep in mind the beta on the market is one. So you can think of this as that divided by beta, and this is the return for bearing, a, you know, a unit of market. This is the this is the return for bearing a unit of market risk. Uh, so, uh, what I should say um, briefly, of course, and, and it sort of goes without saying, um, the beta of asset I is equal to the covariance return on I, return on the market, variance of the market. So, in other words, this is normally written with the beta coefficient right here. We just call, we define, um, we define this thing as as beta, right? Uh, from a undergraduate standpoint, I think it's probably more useful uh, to just write it out as the covariance. Uh, at least then it, it gets you sort of thinking that this is a measure of, of scaled by the variance of the market, but this is a measure of how this asset co-varies with, with, with the market. Um, you know, and you can think with the economy so forth. Again, this is sort of a proxy for what's going on generally. Uh, good. The one thing also I want to say about this, uh, if you want to know where this sort of comes from, um, in earlier chapters, we calculated your optimal amount of risky asset you hold in your portfolio, um, and then the rest going into the risk-free asset. And we call this Y. This was Y is equal to the 
an expected return. Um, so I'm just going to say risky is, you know, I'll just say market portfolio, minus risk free, divided by A, variance of the market. So if we take the average of this over all uh, investors in the, you know, all, all market participants, this will be, the, this is the degree of risk aversion. This will be the average degree of risk aversion. And this is going to average out to one. Because while I may save, if, if, if I'm saving by definition, so if I have 80% of my portfolio in the market and I'm lending out 20%, then that somebody is borrowing that 20% and investing it in the market. So the idea is, uh, on average, um, the, you know, everyone has 100% in the market. Uh, borrowing and lending just shifts people to having less than 100% of their portfolio in the market or more than 100% of their portfolio. So if this is one, uh, then we can rewrite this as So keep in mind, um, a market risk premium here is a function of the average degree of risk aversion in the market. So in other words, uh, um, keep in mind if, if the degree of risk aversion in the market changes, this, this will change the market risk premium, uh, which will in turn change the expected return on that asset. Anything else I wanted to say? Um, I think that might be it. Good. Beta. Excellent. Well, if there's more to say, I'll, I'll say it in future lectures. Uh, good. Return. Um, anything else I want to say about the CAD time? No, I'll leave it with that. Good.